Well, good morning, Southside. I'd like to welcome anyone who might be visiting with us. We're always grateful to have anyone come join the family as we worship the living God. So we pray that you will join with us now and worship through the Word of God as we open it up this morning. We were blessed at the men's retreat, as you've already heard, and so I just thank uh, Brother Sean Killian, who took that on and gave a lot of, a lot of labor. Uh, it was really sweet. And, and he just thanks all those. There's a bunch of you that jumped in to help him, and so we are grateful because the, the men really locked shields, and we had a beautiful time together with each other and in the Word of God. And so the, the ladies um, in Trench is coming up uh, here in, I, th- I think, about a month. And so what, what happened with the men is, I, I think some of our relationships journeyed what would it take 10 years just coming on Sundays and seeing each other. And so I, I just want to encourage every lady to, to come to this, to sign up. It, the, the blessings are amazing. And, and if you're a little nervous, I don't know anybody or anything like that, it just, uh, you were just in, engulfed, okay? So just... Come, and and I think it's going to be a beautiful time together, so I want to encourage you with that. Every sin on him was laid. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. And so this gospel has taken away guilt in life. We stand before God by the work of Jesus Christ, not guilty. And now that fear of death that held us in bondage has been released because he went into death and he, he broke its jaw. He, he defeated it and destroyed it. And so we gather now as those with no guilt, though with those sinners before God and no fear of death, we can walk right into it now because Jesus has conquered the grave. The reality and power of the gospel then is what we've been looking at. We're currently studying through the book of Romans. If you'll turn, we're in Romans chapter 12. This is uh, any bride that a bridegroom would love, the beauty of how we respond to such a gospel, how we live uh, in community and love to one another. Last week, we finished up this first section, our second section, uh, 12, 9 through 13, where we learned that in Christ now, to have a love that's not hypocritical, when we were in Adam, all of our love was usury. It was how to get people to accept us, approve us, or how to get God to accept us and approve us. And this gospel has made it now where by His Spirit we can live love in a genuine, real way. Now this morning, we're going to turn our attention to a different thought, a different matter in verses 14 through 21. And I really see this now as it's called enemy love, those who persecute us. And again, this is as as a community, how do we help each other bear the wrongs and the harms and the persecutions that come at us? Again, it's a a community project. It's individual, but it's it's a family helping each other bear these things. And so we're going to take that up here for the next few weeks. We're going to move into how the believer thinks and responds and loves to those who hunt them down, who, who persecute them, who do them wrong. And some, this can be perceived wrongs or actual wrongs. How do, I, how do I deal with that? How do I respond the way Jesus would want me to? I don't think we could look at a more fitting teaching or a need in our day and age. The, the air we breathe is, is, is this concept is enemy love. The, the Christian ethic toward those who persecute us, it's otherworldly. It's not like this world. It's the opposite of our flesh. How do I respond when someone wrongs me inside the church or outside the church? Because as I have watched this country ever since, ever since the fall, but ever since COVID and politics and our economy, it's, it's just a world of retaliation. It's aggressive attacks, gnarly dudes writing people off. It, it, I've never seen anything like it. It's, it. it's all around us. And all of a sudden, our calling is we are these bright lights to be set apart and shine into the darkness so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. You want to be different than this world? What we are about to look at is otherworldly than anything I know of. This will stand out from our age and the spirit of it. Humble, 
forbearing, forgiving, mercy-showing people in the midst of wrong and mistreatment. I don't think anything gets closer to the gospel than this. Than mercy being shown to haters and enemies. That is the ground we all stand on this morning in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This whole Bible is built on this concept. And so by the mercies of God, we're to show mercy to even our enemies and our aggressors and our persecutors. This is otherworldly for sure. And so in this section, Paul's going to begin to open this up and he's going to show us, remember back to Romans 12, 1 and 2, the will of God as children of God. Now, what is God's will for us in this arena, in this area? It's that by his spirit who dwells within us, this fruit could spring up into our lives to bring transformation. Like I, I, no one can do this in their flesh. And some of your flesh is probably already fighting it. And, and, and God's spirit can transform us into these kind of men, women, and children. And so I pray with all my heart, God, make us into this kind of people by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read our passage, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to open this up. Look with me in Romans 12, beginning in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's no other teaching like that on the face of the earth. Let's go to our God. Father, this is otherworldly. This will set us apart in a world that hates and seeks revenge and kills its enemies, wants their destruction. God, this can't come out a natural man. This will never come out. And so we thank you that you've put the Holy Spirit within us. Through this gospel of Jesus Christ, you've reconciled us and you've joined us to him. And you did. You gave us the engagement ring of your Holy Spirit within. Holy Spirit, would you bear this fruit in every Christian life here this morning? God, whatever is in our flesh that's causing us not to be this, metamorphose us this morning with truth. Reveal, shine your light, show us and bear it as we look at Christ bearing our hatred and sin on the cross in our place. God, produce this fruit in every life here this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And so I want to start with a little overview of this passage that's before us. I don't want you to miss the clear teaching and, and dive in so deep that we, we lose the forest for the trees. So let, let's glance at the forest this morning. If you'll just look at me, Paul talks about, or not look at me, look with me. <laughs> I'm trying to help you, not harm you. <clears throat> so in Romans 12, 14, I want you to notice the negative. Um, don't curse. Don't curse those who persecute you. In verse 17, don't Pay back evil for evil. And verse 19, don't take your own revenge. And in verse 21, don't be overcome by evil. And now I want you to look at the positive side. In verse 14, bless, bless those who persecute you. In verse 18, if it's possible, be at peace with all men as much as possible with you. And verse 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed them, thirsty, give them a, a drink. 
In verse 21, overcome evil with good. I, I think that's a summary statement of the whole passage. Overcome evil with good. So it's very clear what this section is about. Are you with me? It's not confusing. Don't let us come out of this section without that clarity and the grace to live out what Paul is going to be exhorting in our new life in Jesus Christ. So just a few notes before we begin. We've been laboring to not be moralists who come to Romans 12 and just say, in my own strength, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to work hard. And if I can't do this, I'm, I'm condemned. There's no hope for me. We've been laboring in the gospel. I want you to see out of the depth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a new freedom and work of the Holy Spirit. He begins from the inside and works to the outside, and it flows out to love, to love God and love others. It all flows out of therefore. Therefore, in verse 1 from the gospel, we just want to worship God now with our lives as a living sacrifice. How? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can know what the will of God is, child. So what is the will of God? Verse 3, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Your mindset is to be different than when you were in Adam than when you thought the thoughts of this world. When self was exalted, it was loved, it was always first, self-consumption, that's where we all lived. And we thought more highly of ourselves. If I had to describe an unbeliever, we think too highly of ourselves. So what is the answer then for us who have remaining sin in our lives that still fights us with self and battles us? Well, in verse 3, Paul says it's faith. Faith turns away from self, self-exaltation, self-sufficiency, self only, and it looks to Jesus Christ. He's all. He's, he's my only hope. He's it. He's the glory. He's the beauty. I, my faith turns from me. I'm, I found something better than me. The glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. He's my all in all. I, one man said this, we don't need mirrors in the church, we need windows where we look through them and we see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. Humility, we've gone over this. I'm going to say it again. Christ is all. A high self-esteem, you need a Christ esteem. You need to be put in your, not think too highly of yourselves. And in a low self-esteem, you know what you need? Christ esteem. So whether you, 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 you just feel you're horrible or you think you're the greatest gift to the world, I'm God's gift to the world, you need Jesus. You need to, he has to become more important than whether you have high or low self-esteem. The only remedy is by faith to look to Christ. That's the fight of faith, to be turning away from self to Christ. Mm. So let's begin one last comment I heard this week. As you walk out of the prison, justified, stand before God not guilty, and you praise him for his gospel, we walk out now, and in our text, we're going to meet three people. We're going to meet persecutors. There's going to be those who hate you and come after you, and we're going to meet weepers, those who are weeping over some kind of pain or affliction. And we're going to meet rejoicers where there's just something they're rejoicing in that God has blessed them with. And the ones who have faith in Jesus, who are renewing our minds to what the will of God for us is with these kind of people, how do we respond to them as the children of God? And the first one is the persecutors, bless, bless, don't curse them. And when you meet those who weep, you weep with them. And when you meet rejoicers, you don't get jealous, you rejoice with them. That's the, the new creation in Jesus Christ with these type of people. And there's something amazing and healing that could take place in this section this morning, and I, I've been praying for that for you. There is a way by God's will and His Spirit and His Word 
to heal you this morning, to be set free from great wrongs and hurts that have been done to you. And there, there's a, there are so, uh, the hardest thing about being a pastor is how deep some of the hurts are. And so when I say this, I'm not being cavalier or careless or not concerned. I'm so concerned that I want to set you free. It says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You don't have to carry this around the rest of your life like a 500-pound weight. And you hear the words like rejoice. And you're like, what? does anybody know what I'm facing? I hate the word rejoice. And some of you are so garrisoned in that you're so entrenched with all of your hurts and your wrongs, nobody's coming in. I, no one will ever hurt me again. I'm a rock. I'm an island. And you're, you won't hurt me. And maybe it's just been someone who hurt you in a church, this church, a parent, teacher, sibling. Maybe it was me. I just want you to hear something really big is God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And, and there's grace for those who have been humbled before God and, and it can flow. Our, our pride blocks it and it stomps it. And so maybe the whole reason we could be dried up like a grape or withered or not making progress in the Christian life is there someone who's wronged you, maybe persecuted you, and you just won't let go? It's, it's familiar. And I, I like the phrase, it's, it's barbed you. It, it's got your heart, and you just can't get unbarbed. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is to come and take that barb and to release it. Um, you, don't, you want harm done to these people. You want revenge, at least some disgrace. Maybe a, a failure would be cool. And it just, it sits on you daily. And you're trying to do an end around and skip it and live the Christian life. And you just can't seem to get there. And it's, it's blocking the, the flow of grace to be this kind of person. And, and you're a landmine. You're, you're trying to have a marriage, and every time one little thing happens, you give them a 10 response. You go to work, and you blow up at all your work. It's just, I'm just a walking landmine. Dad's a little bit touchy. It's hurting you. It's hurting your relationships. And what we call it is bitterness, not freedom. And so I've come this morning just praying, I want everyone in this room to have freedom from that in the gospel. I truly want to be a minister for your joy this morning to put this to bed and to rest that you could be free to live the Romans 12 life because you have been loved by God. I want you to hear this when you were his enemy. You were his eternal devoted enemy, persecuting him all of your days and he sought you and he bought you with redeeming blood victory in Jesus. So as we start this morning, what God has been teaching me is that this is great truth. And until it touches home, and my flesh and my heart and my soul have been in a civil war, and I'm glad to share this with you, as the greatest of sinners, I am prone to defend and to retaliate sinfully. And so I, I stand just asking the Spirit of God to keep working in me and you to bring us to this sweet place. And when I say sweet place, this is the sweetest place you could be. So come journey with me this morning and ask God if he'll unbarb your heart if you're sitting here in bitterness, revenge, retaliation, I can't let go. Do you know what they did to me? There's, there's a place in the Christian life to let it, let it be released at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. So I think we need to pray again. Father, this is so important. Please let those who are stuck 
see the remedy this morning. God, I pray that you would begin the healing process. Sometimes it's instant. Sometimes it's years and years of renewing our mind. And I pray that you know each soul perfectly here this morning. And, and you know what hurts. And you know what has them barbed. And I ask by your spirit and the truth of your word that you would bring release. You would open dungeons and let light shine in. Lord, I pray, do a mighty work in our midst. And I pray, let us be those who pray and bless and curse not those who mistreat us. Do this in our hearts this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's look at our divine ethic for the children of God. This is a radical directive. The believer's response to persecution, to wrongdoing, to harm, to evil. Paul says, bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. Those who have been born of God, not of this world, Romans 12, 2, is, is if you uh, live this life, the world's going to be trying to get you to live into its mold. And if you don't, they're going to persecute you. They're going to come after you. They're going to want to destroy you. You go live this way, and I'm telling you, unbelievers are going to hate you. You're going to be so salty, they're just going to have to get you out of their life. This passage assumes that you will be persecuted for following after Jesus Christ and being his true Disciple. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, if you live godly in this present age, you will be persecuted. And Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. It says they called, Christ says they, they called me Beelzebul. How much more are they going to call you the followers? This world hated Jesus Christ and they nailed him up on a tree. And as we are conformed to his image, don't think the world's going to applaud. It's going to hate you. They will applaud morality till the cows come home. But anyone who is like Jesus Christ, they want to remove. Sometimes it'll be blatant. Sometimes it'll just be rolling the eyes or gossiping behind your back. But it will come. And you might have to stand against sin in your own family. And when you do, venom will come. And so the question this morning, what is going to be your reaction of the new man or woman in Christ when it comes? And what I see is we just want to take them down with our arguments and prove them, and, and it, we're just ready to fight. I'm a fighter, not a lover. So my first thought is, let's start with what is the reaction of the carnal man, the unbeliever? And the reaction is, curse not. Translated would be, stop cursing. It's, it's just, you're cursing them. And in the Bible, Paul's saying, stop cursing them. The natural flow, when we are wronged or mistreated, the first thing that will come out will be from our lips, set in motion against the one who has wronged us. Let's go. Let's burn them. Let's hurt them. Let's go that direction. That's our instinctive reaction because we are born in Adam. And self rules and anything that touches self, I will take down. The flesh wants to strike. The word curse means to call down judgment upon them from God. God damn you to hell. It also carries the attitude behind such a curse, the, the heart behind it, and Paul says, stop it. That's not the way the one who has been joined to Jesus Christ, who was an enemy, responds to his enemies. That's not how our Savior responded to his enemies. In all honesty, I must say, this could be the hardest of all the commands in the section. To love your brothers and be brotherly. But this one is now those who hate us. And he's calling for love. There's something within us called pride and self, and it just wants to strike. The temptation is, let me give you a piece of my mind. And Christ says, no, no, give him your prayers instead of a piece of your mind. He says, bless. 
bless and curse not, as Paul writes by the Holy Spirit. And I I think he repeats it twice because it's so startling. Bless? Yeah, bless and curse not. I know you've been taught, as Jesus said, to retaliate, to protect your rights, get even with your enemies. If someone hurts you, hurt them back. But he came and he brought a new ethic for the kingdom of God. Stop cursing and bless them. It's an interesting word. Again, it means to call down God's gracious power on a person. So instead of his judgment, you're actually calling down his graciously benefiting them. God, act kindly toward them. The Greek word is eulogeo. What English word do you think we get from that? Yeah, eulogy. Anyone know what a eulogy is? It's, it's at, at memorial services and funerals, and we stand up and we eulogize the, the, the loved one who has gone on. Have any of you been to a funeral where everyone got up and said, this guy was a scoundrel? This guy was a liar? I couldn't stand him. He was a gutless cheat. You know, I've never heard that. Well, one time, one time I heard it. I, I've, I hope mine isn't the second time. <laughs> You don't do that. A eulogy is where we come and we, we speak well. And usually everyone is a saint when we do our eulogies. And so we speak well and we pray for God's blessing upon them. Eulogize them. Matthew 5, 43, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. You'll be like God. For what does God do? He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? Don't the greatest sinners even do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, uh, what do you do more than other people? Don't the Gentiles even do this? But when you come into the kingdom of God, it's greater. It's different. Unbelievers like those who like each other. They they have their friends. They're nice to, but enemies. And he says, therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Again, Jesus Christ is the one who fulfilled that. God gives sun and rain and food to those who hate him, to those who deny him as they drink up the only sovereign one who could give these gifts, and they curse him, and they take his name in vain, and they reject him. And God doesn't look at what they do to him. God does not look at what they do to him, uh, the common goodness of all of it, Denver, no one, no one ever got up this morning and said, God, why are you so kind that you gave us sun again and that the earth is still moving? God is so good to the godless and they defame him and they hate him and they say all kinds of evil against him and none of it's true. The, the retaliation sometimes is that's not true. And so everything they're saying against God, it's not true. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So we are called in this new kingdom, rightly related to Christ, loved by him, to love enemies and pray for those who persecute us so that we might be sons of the Father. I was was thinking of uh, Jim Elliott when he went over and went to minister to the Aka Indians and they were speared to death, him and I believe it was four others. And then his wife, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, later goes back to that tribe and she ministers the gospel and leads to Christ, the one who speared her husband to death. Love your enemies. 
Jesus said in Luke 6, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. It's not a, this isn't a call to just ignore it. It's not a call to say, forget about it, just press on. Don't, 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 don't fight, just move on. I just want you to see this is way bigger than that. Are you seeing that Christianity always goes to the radical extreme? Always. Agape. Don't just meet needs. Have koinonia with them, he said. Enter in. Their needs become your needs. Persecute people. Uh, that, that word persecute, uh, to get people in your home to show hospitality. Go, go after them. Dig in. It's, it's just go to the extreme. And now it's not as simple as don't curse them. Don't pray for their destruction every day. Avoid them, hate them, slander them. It's stop cursing, bless them. Fill it with desire for their good. Who can do that? It isn't just, I'll just avoid them. I'll stay away from them. He's saying, you're not just going to turn from cursing them. You're turning to blessing them. I want you blessed, enemy. I want God to pour out all of his favor and kindness on you. That's gospel. Lord, this can't be. Do you know what they did to me? He just says, do you know what I did for you? I didn't spare my own son so that I could forgive you and bring you into my presence forever. You haven't, this is hard, you haven't truly forgiven until you can do this. I meet with many who say, I've forgiven that hurt, but I could never go to this place. I'm, I, I've walked away from it, I'm done hating them, but I, I can never go to this. There's work to be done. Don't be satisfied with just not hating them. God's wanting you to be set free and to move into this sweet place this morning. I have a friend that I went to seminary with, and he has a series in ACBC. His name was Milton Vincent, and he has a series on forgiveness. If you could go hunt it down, it's fantastic. And he just says there's times when you, you can't forgive. You're, you're stuck, and you know you should, and you're stuck, and that's where you could be this morning and he, and he has this series where you do a 360 around the cross of Jesus Christ, and you come and look at it from every angle until your heart releases and enters into this place. And so I, I, I want you to do a 360 around the cross and just keep staring at it until he gives you this release. The cross can take our hurt and broken hearts from wrong and release them, and we can actually want their blessing and not their harm by the Holy Spirit alone. I know what I'm asking is impossible. God is saying, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's possible with him. And so I just encourage you, I know this is complicated and deep. Seek out your, your leaders, community groups, elders, deacons, just seek people out. Don't stay stuck in this place because I've, I've just journeyed it for 30 some years, guys. To just silently carry it isn't the answer. And, and you have people who love you and want to help you. And it, I know it's complex. And, and we got to dig in and start. Don't just stay content in it and be bitter and be angry and not progress in your Christian faith. So I just, I'm, I'm encouraging you to let us shepherd you to this sweet place that Paul's leading us to this morning. So the child of Adam... When you are stricken, out comes bitter water. And the child of Christ, when you are stricken, out comes the sweet water. And you know my favorite quote from the Puritan Thomas Cramner. Uh, he might have been before the Puritans, actually. And it said of Thomas Cramner, if you want a favor from him, go do him a wrong. And I just, that's the spirit. That's the spirit. When Bonhoeffer was waiting to be executed, he said this verse was his supreme pillow, his supreme command. In Luke 9, Jesus said, It came about 
when the days were approaching for his ascension, that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem to go do redemption. And he set messengers on ahead of him. <clears throat> and they went and they entered a village of the Samaritans, uh, what Nate read about, to make arrangements for him. And they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? The sons of thunder. Do you, Lord, should we just throw fire down on this city that's rejecting you? And Jesus didn't just smile. He turned and says he rebuked them. He rebuked them. You don't know what kind of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And you're praying for their lives to be destroyed. Do you know what spirit you're of? I came to seek and to save that which was lost. The, the, the way they get saved is by enemies that they're killing and mistreating. And when Jesus comes out of them, that's the gospel. I've heard more testimonies of people getting saved when they're persecuting and destroying Christians. I was one of them. Crazy brother Steve got saved and we just abused him to no end. And every time we did, he'd put his head down and prayed for us. And it just made me matter and matter and matter until finally it broke. That was salt in my heart and in my soul. And he still is salty to me. <laughs> just beautiful, beautiful man. So, do you know what kind of spirit you're of this morning? Of Jesus. His spirit who, who came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and he's hanging on a cross and they're just destroying him. He could have called down the 10,000 legions right then. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the spirit that you are. They hated him. They said he had a demon. They took up stones to kill him. They scourged him. They mocked every office, prophet, priest, and king. He punched him in the face. If you're a prophet, who's hitting you? Priest, he saved others. Come off that cross. And they put the crown on him and they're beating him, making fun of him as a king. They're tenacious against him. There's no mercy. They nail him up to a cross. And there was never anyone more innocent ever than Jesus Christ. And they're hurling insults and mocking him. And you expect them to say, isn't it enough? Haven't you had enough fun already? Father, forgive him. It's not he or she has hurt me. And now I'm going to make them hurt. They're going to hurt like I do. I will slander them till their name is disgraced. Do you know what spirit you are of? It's just cancer in a soul to hold that. Milton Vincent, he said, forgiveness is letting the person out of prison and realizing that you were the one in it. It's a prison to hold yourself in this bitterness and this unforgiveness. I think of Stephen when they're stoning him and he falls on his knees and he cries out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Bless, bless and curse not. Do, do not curse. We're on holy ground this morning. And you might say, Pastor, you've got my conscience. My mind has been renewed. This is the will of God for me as a child of God. I'm convinced it's true and it's right. But how do you do it? How can this be done. Is there anything more difficult than this? The answer is no. I want you to hear this this morning. Only a Christian can do this. So you must have a therefore in Romans 12, 1, is that you have realized your sinful condition. You are an enemy of God. You're committed to self. You want to be God. You can't change your nature. You can't fix the selfish heart. You just can't get it to turn. And you have to come to Jesus Christ 
who came into this world and he did go up on a cross for every sin that you ever committed. It has to be punished. And Jesus bore the wrath of God in your place so that he could forgive you of every sin. He, he, could, he could bury it in the deepest sea and separate it as far as the east is from the west. That's what he came to do. And this morning, you're stuck. You're angry. You hate, you hate God. You hate everybody around you from the hurt that happened to you. And Jesus is saying, with your hurt and your, all your sin, come to me and I will forgive you and give you rest for your soul. You've been in counseling, you've tried drugs, you've tried every possible thing and you sit here as bitter as the day it started. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus to heal this deep hurt and the sin of your own heart and your bitterness and your hatred. There is a gospel for you. For the believers, I want to give you a reasoning process to work through. I want you to see this isn't just some feeling. It's faith. In Romans 12, 3, it's not thinking too highly of yourself, which is hard not to do when you've been hurt, is, is, is to, by faith, look away to Jesus. You must look to Christ. And here's the things I want you to remind yourself in renewing your mind for this to flow. Remind yourself of God's reaction to you. This has helped me more than anything. I want you this morning to remember who you were in Adam. That you were born into sin and you were suppressing the truth of God by his creation in unrighteousness. Romans 5.10 says you were an enemy of God. From the core of your being, you hated God. There was an enmity between you and God that could never go away. You couldn't fix that. Come back to how much you hated him. Oh, I love God. Until you heard the true God and what he requires of you, then you hated him. And so all of us were enemies of God. We were disobedient to him. We could never love. We could only love ourselves. We were in bondage to self. What was there in us that could ever commend God to us? God says there's none righteous, not even one. No one could ever do enough to get his favor. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We all sat under the wrath of God for eternity. We were all there, enemies. And what did God do with us? What did God do with his enemies? He did not curse us. He cursed his son. He should have cursed us in hell forever. And he put his son up on a cross and he cursed him. That's what God did. How am I going to treat my enemies? I'm going to put my son on a cross and curse him. I'm going to pour out all my wrath on him for your sin. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's how, that's how God dealt with you. Persecuting him, saying all kinds of evil. I thought about the prodigal son. God, all I want is your inheritance. I don't want you. And he runs into all the pig slop and spends it in trash and sin. And he finally realizes, man, my ser the servants are treated better. I'm going to go back to my father. And the minute the father sees him, he lifts his skirt and goes running to him and kills the fattened calf and puts a ring on his finger and just says, my son has returned in spite of what a fool he's been. <laughs> That's how God treats us. So I want you to consider this, brothers and sisters. Your whole life in eternity hangs on undeserved mercy from God for the greatest persecutor of him and hater of him who ever lived. Your whole life depends on God showing you mercy. Who hated him. And now we're to have the same spirit as God had. It's an inner contradiction of the soul to hate and want to destroy your enemies. It's just a contradiction to the new spirit and the new life. And it's killing you. It's killing you. 
He died for you when you hated Him. And now someone wrongs you and you want to call down God's wrath on them. When you cry out for God to curse them, stop. What if that were how God treated me? I'm sure no matter how bad someone has hurt you, it is nothing compared to what you did to God. It's lopsided. By faith, child of God, that is the grounds that we all must live upon. And secondly, why are we behaving? Why are they behaving this way toward me? There's a good time to ask that question. And Paul says it's, they're proving that you're a Christian. In Philippians, he says, wear it like a badge. When they persecute you, it, it proves you're a child of God. Just thank you. I'm, I'm light. I'm salty. They're hating me because I love Christ. You've tried to love them and bring the gospel, and they hate you. Jesus said, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's showing you your kingdom of citizens of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. It's all false, and it's on account of Jesus that they're doing it. Rejoice. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice. It's showing that you're a child of God, and you are cooking their grits. Hallelujah. So I got to see the persecutor in a whole new way. If I just see his sin and his wrong, it's going to kill me. I got to come and say, this person is unregenerate. They're blind to the truth, their nature. I've got nothing but compassion because I lived in nature's night. I lived in the enemy of God, hating people. They're, they're acting like I always did. And now I've been set free by the grace of God and nothing in me. Oh, I have compassion for this lost, bound sinner under, under God's wrath that I once sat under and I still would be sitting under. He's a dupe of Satan. He's a slave of sin, the persecutor. He was me before grace appeared and brought salvation. Amen? And then I want you to move to thinking about their eternal condition and to begin to realize this soul is going to be under the wrath of God forever. And that doesn't make me happy. That, that, who, who wants that even for your enemy? I don't want that. God, give me compassion for their eternal state and what awaits them. Bless them. Save them. Pour out grace. Open their eyes. Set them free from self. I hated being a slave to self. Nothing more miserable than self dripping out of you everywhere you go. Set them free from that bondage. And then fourthly, desire their salvation and all that it entails. Bless them. Pray for them and for their deliverance. I remember I had a, a deep wrong that was done to me and, and it was hard. It, it was like a spiritual father who did it. And I was just kind of trying to move on and write that season off. To, it, was just, it was just hard. And I just, it just kept barbing me. And it was reading in the Gospel of Luke when he said, pray for those who persecute you. And all of a sudden, you can't pray for someone to be blessed when you're bitter. You'll, it's fake. You'll, you, you know right away I'm a hypocrite. Because at first I used to try that. Oh, God bless them. Uh, and maybe just let a little bit go wrong. You know, let them get a flat tire on the highway and see how that feels. So you know you're a phony. But when the gospel is moving and you're seeing Jesus and what he's done for you and what starts to happen, God bless that man. Pour out grace. Set him free from this bondage and the sin that he's doing to people and hurting them. Let them see your face. Let them have communion with you in such a beautiful way. And you just, it's real. 
And it's flowing from the gospel of knowing how loved you are in Jesus Christ. And it just starts coming out wanting the blessing of those who are hurting you and persecuting you and saying all kinds of evil about you. So I, I pray for that. So for your application, we're out of time. So your application is you need to have good time management and not go over in your sermons. <laughs> but I would be amiss if I didn't at least take one application. I want you to seriously examine your heart before God who knows all things for anyone who's wronged you and just say, God, what's left in my heart? Am I just bearing it or am I blessing and praying for the one who's done it? That with, with judgment day honesty to go get before, to get this cancer out of our souls that's hurting us. Are you just avoiding them? Spreading what they did to others? I need your counsel. This guy did this to me. Could you pray for me? This guy did this to me. It's not it. Maybe a lower scale. They, they've just been insensitive to you or cold and I'm done with them. It's over. I just want you this morning to come to the cross with me and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Come to the cross and by faith, look your eyes out at Jesus Christ and it will start melting the bitterness, the anger, wanting to destroy. That's the only remedy and what can come forth is bless them. Pray for them for grace to flow. And you'll be like your father who's in heaven. You won't be like the gnarly people of this earth. You'll be the sons of God and daughters of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for cutting flesh off our hearts. Justifying bitterness and anger and hatred. God, let us look at Jesus, the one who washes away all my bitterness and anger, the one who died for what I'm feeling even in my heart right now. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. And let us gaze at you, Christ. By your grace, would you melt away all the gross stuff that's built up in our heart toward those who have wronged us. God, let us go one at a time through every hurt and release them at the cross of Jesus Christ and pray for their good and pour out our blessings upon them. God, I pray, bring that kind of freedom to Southside Bible Church. Let this be our Independence Day where we were all set free at the cross of Jesus Christ to go forth in love, love of the brethren and love of the enemies who want to destroy us and have hurt us greatly. God, there is no other kingdom like this. Let us know what spirit we are of. And I pray, Holy Spirit, produce this fruit in us. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, may all men know we're your disciples by our love for one another. Amen.